Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon for this character sheet and a whole bunch more, and like and subscribe for taller friends next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Legolas, whose name solidifies the reason he was brought into the Fellowship. It's a sylvan portmanteau of Lay Egg, which means green, and Golas, which means a collection of leaves. Green is typically a symbolic color of rebirth and growth, and the Fellowship is a collective that was just starting to grow. That or he brought the good green leaf. Wood elves do know how to party. Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need to specialize in our special eyes with eyes that spy on the spies of the big red eyes, spies that spy on our spry guys. I got that in the first take, or I didn't, you don't know. Next, we need some Spanish rice with a rose to turn our enemies into pollo. Finally, we'll make sure that horses like us because who doesn't love horses? For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just make sure you're keeping a sharp eye on your multi-classing minimums. Speaking of, we'll kick things off with wisdom for the sharpest eyes we can have, but with enough foresight to know that we can sharpen them even further. Dexterity next, you're the definitive archer. All fantasy archers are molded after. I guess Paris, but nobody cares about Paris. Paris. Intelligence after that, you need to understand history if you're going to uphold the long-standing grudge against the dwarves, or, you know, don't. Follow that up with constitution, dying is bad, and you're not too bad at dealing with people at short range either. Charisma is a little low, you're hot, but not exactly great at talking to people. We'll dump strength though, all of your weapons are either finesse or ranged, so we don't need it. We're going to be making Legolas a wood elf for the same reason I make a lot of characters humans, because that's what he is. That will give you plus two dexterity and plus one wisdom, 60 feet of dark vision, fey ancestry for advantage on saves against being charmed so you won't try to murder Frodo for the ring like some people. <coughs> Boromir. You don't need to sleep, instead you'll just go into a trance for four hours. Legolas can sleep and walk at the same time. Kind of a weird thing, but okay. All elves get perception for free, that's why their ears are so big, all the better to hear you with my dear. Wood elves get weapons and can run five feet faster per round, which is nice, but not all that complicated. We'll make our own background for animal handling and stealth. You're good with horses and never leave a trail. Give a hoot, don't pollute. Woods the owl build when? We'll kick things off as a fighter, letting you grab two skills from the fighter list, like acrobatics and history. Obviously, the real reason to start here is for archery, letting you add two to your ranged attack rolls and make sure you never miss. You also get second wind, letting you heal 1d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action. Take advantage of the green leaf that is your namesake. Quick note, all of the Lord of the Rings videos have these people thinking that they need to be basic monoclass builds because the archetypes of D&D &D were based off of Lord of the Rings. That happens sometimes, like with Gimli, but it's been a long time since Dungeons & Dragons was originally made and each version has evolved, taking inspiration from other sources. I mean, Matt Mercer invented D&D over five years ago, that's why it's called 5th edition. Just be prepared for when this isn't a pure archer fighter build, okay? Kinda starts off like that though. Second level fighters get an action surge, letting you make two actions in one turn once per short rest, which will let you get two arrows off in a single round right now, and eventually a full on storm of arrows. Third level fighters can choose a martial archetype, and even though Arcane Archer has Archer in the name, it doesn't work for Legolas since his arrows are just arrows. They don't send an Urukai to another dimension, they just blast through their necks. Champions are pretty good at that, thanks to improved critical, letting you critically hit with a 19 or a 20. If you need to land a shot under the arm or in the neck, this is the best way to do that. Fourth level fighters get an ability score improvement. I think dexterity is what we need first. Solid perception is nice, but unerring accuracy is a little bit nicer. You didn't promise Frodo your eyes, after all. 5th level fighters get an extra attack, letting you make 2 attacks instead of 1 with an action, and up to 4 attacks with an action surge. Maybe just load 2 arrows instead of 1. Why doesn't every archer do that? No DM is tracking your arrows. I promise they have other things they're paying attention to. 6th level fighters get another ability score improvement so we can cap off our dexterity modifier right away. That'll make our shots as accurate as possible and deal as much damage as possible. Almost as much damage as possible, I guess. We're gonna get something else later. I'm guessing you can guess what it is. We'll jump over to Ranger now for some more nature-y abilities like Investigation not nature, we're not getting that here. Instead, we'll get canny, which lets you double your proficiency bonus for one of your skills, like perception. If that sounds like expertise, it's because it is expertise. It's just for one skill, so it's worse. You also get a favored enemy that you have an advantage on tracking. I'm taking this instead of favored foe from Tasha's because honestly, it might be better. 
Ranger, everyone. It's such a good class. That was sarcastic, but am I choosing Ranger sarcastically? Of course not. There are plenty of good things from Ranger. They just come in at level two. First, you get another fighting style. Two weapon fighting lets you add your ability modifier to the damage of your offhand weapon attack when you're wielding two weapons. Quick reminder, fighting two-handed means that you attack with your main hand weapon as an action and your offhand weapon as a bonus action. So if you want to swing those elven short swords, you get three attacks per round with no bonus action. Honestly, you don't really need it for much, except for maybe the hunter's mark spell which lets you focus in on one enemy for up to an hour and deal an extra d6 of damage to them with all of your weapon attacks that's the other good part about being a ranger hunter's mark basically makes your bow deal a d14 worth of damage and your short swords will deal 2d6 which is pretty stellar for another spell jump triples your jump distance for a minute that will make up for your bad strength score and the only place you really need to use it jump up on the olefan hide in glorious early 2000s cgi but keep in mind, it still only counts as one. Third level rangers can choose a ranger conclave. Monster slayers get better at spotting the weak spots thanks to Hunter's Sense, letting you spend an action to determine a creature's immunities, resistances, and vulnerabilities an amount of times per long rest equal to your wisdom modifier. You have tons of damage variety with piercing from your arrows or piercing from your short swords. Maybe you'll be in a party with Roy Mustang. That would be nice. You also get Slayer's Prey, letting you pick a target to deal an extra d6 of damage to once per round with a bonus action, stacking with Hunter's Mark to make that first attack per round really, really big. It does only work once per round, still, that can add up to some serious damage, especially with a critical hit. Fourth level rangers get an ability score improvement or feat. The Sharpshooter feat is perfect for you since you're a sharpshooter. It lets you fire at max range without disadvantage, so your long bow can be an extra long bow. You can also ignore all but full cover to get the baddies as long as there's a tiny hole in the door to shoot through, and you can take a negative five penalty to your attack roll to add 10 to the damage roll of your attacks with no limit on how often you can use this. So with extra attack, Hunter's Mark, Slayer's Spray and Action Surge, that's 4d8 plus 5d6 plus 60 damage in a single round, probably enough to take down a cave troll in about 6 seconds, that should impress that cute dwarven man. That's right, I'm a Gimelos shipper, sunk cost fallacy means you're finishing this video anyway. But if we want to be the best ranger, we need to be a rogue. Multiclassing to rogue gives you another skill. I normally recommend starting your multiclass builds with rogue since you'd get one more skill, but we don't even need this bonus skill. So athletics, maybe? It's used for climbing and swimming checks. You're in good shape. We're really here for expertise in two more skills like acrobatics and animal handling, letting you do a backflippy thing onto a horse. You know that thing with the wargs? Holy macaroni, that's cool. You also get sneak attack, letting you add a d6 of extra damage to your attacks when you have an ally within five feet of the target or advantage on the roll. That's even more damage on your first shot. It might be the only one you get, so make it count. Second level rogues get cunning action to dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. Don't get me wrong, you're not bad up close, but you do much better at a distance. Third level rogues can choose a roguish archetype and scouts are like rangers, but with good abilities. You get nature and survival skills for free and expertise in both of those skills as well, putting you at a solid five experted skills, definitely making you a valuable addition to any team. You're also a skirmisher, letting you move half your movement speed as a reaction when someone ends their turn within five feet of you so you can keep your distance. Getting up close is more for Gimli, and by that I mean you getting close to Gimli because you're dating. Another reason that we dipped over to Rogue is Steady Aim, letting you use your bonus action to give yourself advantage with one weapon attack as long as you don't move. That guarantees your 2d6 sneak attack that you get at this level, not to mention effectively doubling your already doubled critical hit chance to roll a ton of dice. Fourth level rogues get another ability score improvement, bump your wisdom modifier to see all the way into the distance you need to catch up to the orcs before they can take the hobbits to Isengard. I said to the meme line, give me thumbs up. Now that we've done enough multiclassing to get the purest sweaty, let's head back to fighter so you can be a remarkable athlete. Adding half your proficiency bonus to skill checks that use strength, dexterity, or constitution, which would include initiative rolls, so you'll be ready to go at the drop of a hat. 8th level fighters get another ability score improvement. Cap off your wisdom modifier so you're almost as good at looking for people as the big bad is. Also, I don't know what y'all want when you ask for Sauron. He's a skyscraper that casts scrying. That's it. Ninth level fighters get indomitable, letting you reroll a failed saving throw once per long rest. You can use this on death saves, which is great because elves aren't supposed to die until they listen to Come Sail Away by Styx. 10th level champions get another fighting style, but since you have archery and two weapon at this point, we don't need much. Might as well grab defense for plus one to your AC while you're wearing armor. Generally, I think this is supposed to be for heavy armor, but it works for studded leather as well, so get it going for your light elven stuff. 11th level fighters get another extra attack for up to three attacks with your action and six with an action surge, helping you turn an orc into an orcupine because it's full of pins. 
Our capstone is the 12th level fighter, giving you one last ability score improvement or feat. Let's scoop up the piercer feat from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, letting you reroll the damage die of one piercing attack per round, and you can add another damage die when you critically hit with piercing damage. That will pair with your arrows and your swords, so you're set no matter what you want to use. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you can pump out some serious damage with 3d8 plus 76 plus 45 damage on your average turn and 6d8 plus 10d6 plus 90 damage on your action surge turn, all with doubled critical hit chance and advantage on one attack that deals 1d8 plus 46 damage by itself and your crits do more damage. There's a whole lot of stuff going on in there and it all makes you do damage. You're also an expert in skills that are useful making your way through Middle Earth, so your party probably won't get lost. Finally, you're really fast and great at disengaging to get where you need to be thanks to cunning action and wood elf speed. For weaknesses, you unfortunately don't have any magical damage. If you want to take another level of ranger just to get magic weapon, they added that to the list in Tasha's. You could do that. You're also lacking in strength, so it might lead to you getting tossed around by some bigger monsters in Middle Earth. Finally, it can take you a little bit of time to get all of your buffs going. Hunter's Mark, Slayer's Prey, Steady Aim, all going together might get you in trouble if your enemy isn't slowly walking up to you. But they probably will be, as long as you set yourself up on top of Helm's Deep. Take aim, let arrows fly, and show everyone why you're one of the best that the elves have to offer. Just maybe ask your dad for some special arrows, otherwise your eternal life might end early. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, subscribe for more. We make two videos every week. Join the Patreon for this sheet and a whole bunch more, and sub to Tulak and Mango for more Tulak fun.